Welcome to my Chapter 2's coverage of ions, molecules, and atoms. In this video, I will teach you about the periodic table atoms and subatomic particles. To begin, for the sake of humor, ha ha ha, I will share you a beautiful chemistry cat of the day from quickmeme.com. This one says, tell a potassium joke, K. Ha ha ha! So by the time we get to the end of this entire chapter, you should have the following skills. First, define the following terms on the periodic table. In other words, you should be able to define all of these terms, list a vocabulary that I'll let you read if you choose. Next, you should be able to define neutrons, protons, and electrons. You should also be able to write chemical symbols out for elements, including isotopes. And you should be able to calculate elements' atomic weights from their relative isotopic abundances. In addition to these, you should be able to define empirical versus molecular formulas, determine the number of electrons in an atom based on its charge, predict the charge of an element's most stable ion, explain what electronegativity is, and be familiar with electronegativity trends on the periodic table, know the difference between ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds, distinguish between ionic and molecular compounds, generate empirical formulas for ionic compounds, generate names for both ionic and molecular compounds, have memorized the following ions' names and formulas, as well as their charges, be able to interconvert between ionic and molecular compounds' names and formulas, and have memorized the names and formulas of the following seven strong acids. Whew! Long list of things to get to, so let's get started, beginning with elements in the periodic table. So there are over 114 known elements. 83 of these are stable and found in nature, though many of them are quite rare. Seven are found in nature, but are radioactive, and 24 or more are not naturally found on Earth, though two or three of these might be found in stars. Elements can be organized according to their properties on a chart that we call the periodic table, which is this table right here. <laughs> okay, so as it turns out, the periodic table is usually shown in this manner, with this rectangle of elements placed down here. Now, it turns out that this depiction of the periodic table, the most common one, is not technically correct. The reason we do it this way is because it fits more nicely on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. But in reality, the actual periodic table should have this cluster or block of elements inserted right in this location. In other words, this is what the real periodic table should look like if it were all drawn out totally correctly with all of the boxes in their proper locations. Again, the reason we don't usually depict it in this way is because it doesn't fit as neatly and as clearly on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in portrait orientation, I guess. Here, by the way, is a cool link to an online periodic table that I invite you to test out because it's pretty entertaining. I will, of course, post this link in the description beneath this video. So each column in the periodic table is called a group. Each row is called a period. Atoms that are in the same group or column as each other have similar properties. Each element is assigned a number called its atomic number. Hydrogen's atomic number, hydrogen is way over here by the way, is one. Helium, which is way over here, its atomic number is two, and so forth and so on down the entire periodic table. You'll also see that in each element's box, there is another number. For example, if we zoom in on hydrogen's box shown right here, the number shown here in the upper left is its atomic number, one. But you see this other number down here for hydrogen? It's 1.00794. That number down here is not the atomic number. That is the element's atomic mass. By comparison, helium's is 4.002602. And again, helium's atomic number is two. You see the difference between the two? Now, there are four different groups or columns that have specific names that I require my university students to know and memorize. Specifically, all of the elements in column one below hydrogen, so this does not include hydrogen, it starts at lithium and goes all the way down. These elements are called the alkali metals. All of the elements from beryllium all the way down in column two are called the alkaline earth metals. The elements over here in column 7a are called the halogens, and the rightmost elements, column 8, are called the noble gases, because they are super noble. So these are the four columns slash groups whose names and locations I require my university students to memorize. So if you're one of my students and you're watching this, please make sure you do so. One other thing you should note, another way of organizing the periodic table is by subdividing it according to metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Specifically, all of the elements that are shown on this chart in blue are metals. You'll see that that is the majority of elements. In contrast, the upper right-hand quadrant of elements here that are red, as well as hydrogen that's shown over here, are non-metals. And this 
tiny staircase of elements in between are called metalloids. They're colorized green here. Turns out that metals and nonmetals have very different properties from each other, and metalloids kind of traverse both worlds. They have some properties that resemble those of metals, and some that resemble those of nonmetals. It's important to take quick or brief note of which elements are metals, nonmetals, and metalloids, as shown here. We now move on to explain the beautiful intricacies of atoms. So we defined atoms in an earlier video linked to in the description below, but I'm going to tell you more information about them here. So atoms, as it turns out, are super tiny, about 10 to the minus 10 meters in diameter. That's 0 0.000000, a bunch of zeros and a one meter. So very, very small. As it turns out that if the atoms in your body were all increased to be just one inch in diameter in size per atom, then you would be able to bump your head on the moon. You'd be that large. Now, because of their tiny size, there is a huge number of atoms in even just a small sample of an element. For example, a half carat diamond, which is made up of lots of carbon atoms, has about 5 times 10 to the 21 atoms. That is a large, large number. It's 5 with a ton of zeros to the right of it. It's just, it's large. It's unfathomably large. Now, it turns out that if you lined up all of these 5 times 10 to the 21 atoms in a line without changing their size in any way, you just put them in a straight line, all of these individual atoms would form a line that would stretch all the way to the sun. That's how many atoms there are in a half carat diamond. Crazy, huh? So as it turns out, there are even smaller particles than atoms, which I call subatomic particles or nucleons that are inside the atoms. Specifically, neutrons are located inside the atom's nucleus. They have no charge and the mass shown right here. Now, the letters AMU are an abbreviation for atomic mass units. One atomic mass unit is equal to exactly one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. We'll talk about that in greater depth in a later chapter. Second are protons. They are also located inside the atom's nucleus, have a plus one charge, and this mass in AMUs, which is pretty close, not exactly, but pretty close to the same as the mass of a neutron. And lastly are electrons. They're located outside the atom's nucleus, have a negative one charge, and a very negligible mass. So negligible, in fact, that we, for the most part, ignore their mass doing calculations until we get to a later chapter on nuclear chemistry. So what do atoms look like? Well, uncharged atoms have nuclei, or nucleuses, where their protons and neutrons, also called nucleons, are located, surrounded by electrons. Now, the electrons zoom around so fast around the nucleus that the electrons make what looks like a big cloud called an electron cloud. In this model, you can see the protons and neutrons right here in the middle. They're represented by this little cluster right in the middle in the nucleus. And these smaller spheres that are zooming all around the nucleus across a larger total three-dimensional area, they represent electrons. So a hydrogen atom, which is shown right here, has a nucleus, represented by this sphere in the middle here, that has just one proton and zero neutrons. And it has only one electron zipping around its nucleus to make its electron cloud, shown as a dark gray spherical cloud right here.